Hi everyone and welcome to uh, ASCO 2024. I'm Chris Wallace and I'm really pleased to be here with Somroy uh, from a Rush here in Chicago, very close to home at ASCO for you, Som. Uh, yes. Thanks yes. so much for joining uh, today. We're uh, talking about one of your uh, many ongoing papers, <laughs> but uh, one presented here at ASCO. Um, really, I think, builds on a, a theme that came out of the um, oral abstracts uh, as well uh, at this year's ASCO, which is the idea of using non-prostate cancer therapies and their effects on prostate cancer patients. So maybe give us a bit of context for your paper, which focused on the NMCRPC space. Right. Thank you, Chris, for this opportunity. I really appreciate it. Uh, so to give a little bit of context, so since my early days, I have been very interested in utilizing these, uh, like the oncologic role or maybe non-oncologic role of these medications that people commonly use in different settings of prostate cancer. As you know, we have published in localized prostate cancer. We have published with the latitude data in MHSPC, metastatic hormone sensitive. So this was again to look for two main things in the non-metastatic castrate resistant prostate cancer setting. Number one, so apalutamide is one of the established regimen along with ADT in this setting. So my goal was to see whether there is basically a drug to drug interaction. Now I don't, I couldn't analyze the pharmacokinetics data, but what we could do is look at the subgroup analysis, both on a multiplicative scale and additive scale to see if the treatment effect of aplutamide on metastasis survival as well as overall survival varied depending on patients taking these medications like mm -hmm. metformin, like statin, like the proton pump inhibitors, and then angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors and aspirin. And uh, the other aim was to see, and this is very exploratory, is that whether there was any independent association of these medicines with the oncologic outcome like MFS as well as OS mm -hmm. in non-metastatic castrate resistant prostate cancer after we adjust for all the potential confounders. Mm -hmm. So what we found is very interesting. Um, like the exploratory analysis was actually showed us confirmatory evidence that apalutamide efficacy doesn't vary. Like the medical oncologist or the urologist or radonks, whoever prescribe apalutamide for NMCRPC patients should not be varying their prescription just because patients are taking this kind of medications because mm -hmm. there was no evidence of heterogeneous treatment effect based on ex like concomitant receipt of these medications. What was interesting is that, again, very exploratory, but we found that exposure to metformin and angiotensin-converting uh, enzyme inhibitors were independently associated with improved metastasis-free survival in these patients. Now, again, taking these medications could be associated with several bias, for example, immortal time bias, like the patients are not dying up until they are taking it, right? So that is falsely inflating the, the time to death for this group of patients. Also, these taking these medications regularly could actually allude to a health-seeking behavior. Maybe these patients are more aware, more thoughtful about their overall health condition, and that might be reflective in their compliance to the anti-cancer intervention, and maybe that is what is reflected in their improved metastasis free survival. But still, it is, it is hypothesis generating, mm -hmm. and it is exciting data to see. So it's very interesting. I mean, you know, we heard a presentation uh, from Anthony Joshua yesterday on uh, metformin. I think, you know, this is part of a, a really large body of literature looking at using potentially non-oncologically designed medications for oncologic benefits. So metformin, as you say, statins have been, you know, heavily explored. Um, so I guess the, the real question there is, is do we change our behaviors for cancer treatment based on what people are doing already? And that's one question I think you alluded to. And then the second question is, do we actually per change our prescribing behaviors and prescribe medications for that are, are indicated in one space for a cancer outcome? And I think, uh, I don't, I'm interested in your thoughts. I think we're not quite there yet. No. Um, but certainly, 
you know, the track record of these medications and their known safety profile makes them appealing agents to uh, introduce into the, the cancer clinic if we can get some benefit from them. Right, exactly. And there are some like underlying mechanisms by which these medications can have some oncologic benefits, like for example, metformin blocking the complex one in the electron transport chain, or the PPI is actually causing some Warburg effect, and that might actually cause some changes in the immune cell or immune environment. But these are very hypothesis generating things, and I would not necessarily proceed that far to add these into the uh, like the prescription or anti-cancer prescription just based on this kind of exploratory analysis. I think what would be interesting is to do some small proof of concept cohort studies perspective or maybe randomized studies. I think cohort studies would be more feasible to do mm. and see what come out of that and then that can help us change our practice in one direction versus the other. Yeah, I was just going to ask you what you think the next step is, how we go from these exploratory data to to a more conclusive sort of feeling. I think the metformin story we heard yesterday is one of those maybe cautionary tales where we saw a lot of preclinical rationale, we saw some good epidemiologic data, and yet when put to a randomized trial it, uh, it failed. And so what do you think we need to do? Is it, you know, a randomized control trial is always the answer, but is there anything we can do between here and there to help us better understand what's going on? Yeah, so we can potentially do like a, like a we can build a registry, prospective mm. registry of patients, and then we can collect not only their oncologic outcome, but also their patient reported outcome, because that is important for advanced prostate cancer. And you saw yesterday also there was a lot of talk that uh, n most of these uh, pro tools doesn't don't even capture what is required to be captured, but it is what it is, what we have now. So we can actually build prospective registry. I know that uh, we talked about Dr. Joshua, he's like um, in big into this field. I know prin like Princess Margaret has done work on that. Ottawa has done some work. So maybe we build a prospective registry where we treat these patients. They, they go there, they follow their natural process, but they are getting these uh, drugs and we are prospectively collecting their dose, their compliance, mm. and their PROs, maybe collecting some serological biomarkers and as well as metabolic biomarkers, and then do not only see prospectively their outcome, but also correlate these metabolomics as well as seromic biomarkers, uh, which will be like more orthogonal biomarkers and see whether we can predict the response to, or treatment response to these drugs in the context of maybe not only in M NMR NMCRPC, maybe MHSPC, NMCRPC, mm. or even metastatic castrate resistant prostate cancer. Because whatever has been published in metastatic castrate resistant is again almost exploratory. So mm. uh, like we need something prospective. A randomized controlled trial would be gold standard, as we all know, but very difficult to do in a real practical world. Nobody's probably going to fund that kind of study. So I think doing a prospective registry-based study with some grant money or something could be the way forward. Absolutely. Well, congratulations again Thank on you. your great work presented Thank you. here. And uh, thanks for joining us. Thank you so much. I really appreciate this opportunity. Thank you.